I was just starting out as a scientist when I was a graduate student. So after I had left college and was going to do some studies uh, to get my PhD, um, one of the first places I got to go, and I was really fortunate to get to go there, was Antarctica. So the bottom of the world. Uh, and I wanted to start with you guys. There's me standing there on some rocks. Uh, I wanted to start with you guys by asking you to think while you're sitting there at home. Think to yourself, when you think of Antarctica, what are the things you think about? What pops into your head right away? So you don't have to say, just think about it, or you can talk about it if you're watching with somebody else. I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds maybe. Think of some things, what's in Antarctica? What's in Antarctica that's only down there? A lot of people don't think of the fossils. So usually when I ask that question, people say things, and I can talk to them, people say things like they think about ice and snow, and that's for sure. There's tons of ice down there, humongous ice sheets. Most of the ice in the world is down in Antarctica. All around the coast, there's big old icebergs. Of course, there's penguins. Penguins live down in Antarctica, and they are fantastic. When I was down there, I definitely got to see some, some emperor penguins, some Adelie penguins, these non-flying birds. They live in Australia and New Zealand and South America too, but always down south, right? There's no penguins up at the North Pole. They're all down at the South Pole. The fact that it's on the bottom, a lot of people, you know, if you look at a map, you might have a map in your house that doesn't have Antarctica on it because a lot of the maps we make just show the continents that people are usually on. Sometimes they forget all about Antarctica being way down there at the bottom. And the other thing people think about usually is exploration. So Antarctica was the very, very, very last landmass on Earth that humans ever found and explored, which is a pretty crazy thing to think about. As far as we know, nobody saw or really knew about Antarctica until the 1820s. So only 200 years ago do we even find this continent. That's pretty crazy to think about. So there's a lot of cool history around that polar exploration and I'm gonna to touch on some of it here uh, in a second. When I think about Antarctica, given the time period I study, this is what I think of. So if I was with you guys and we weren't over Zoom, I would ask you, do you know what this is or do you know what we're looking at right now? Hopefully you can tell that it's, oh, I see it. Oh, I'm gonna do this. What's up in the chat? Oh, <laughs> you're in the chat. So that's a map of the world, which is uh, not the world you guys probably know, right? This is what the world looked like about 250 million years ago. So all the continents there are together. Oh, here we go in the Q&A. That's it. Pangea, that's right, Jen. <laughs> so when Pangea is a thing, this is what it looks like. We have a really pretty good idea of what Pangea would have looked like. I think it kind of looks like a Pac-Man. It's kind of open and there's islands in the middle that are like the little dots that it's eating. But the rest of the world, a huge amount of the world is open ocean. And so when I think about Antarctica, this is the time and the time period I study, which are the Permian period and the Triassic period, which we're gonna talk about a little later. This is what the world looked like then. So Antarctica is not covered in snow and ice. There's no dinosaurs yet, so there's definitely no birds, so there's definitely no penguins, but this is that kind of world. What else we got? <laughs> so I wanted to show you guys, so the places where I go to look for fossils in Antarctica, the blue star on the map now is where I go to look for fossils. And then I put a ISU orange star about where Pocatello would have been on this world. So the west coast of the US hasn't been built up yet. So California, Washington, they don't, they're coming, but they don't exist yet on the side of North America. Idaho is almost on the coast. So that's Pocatello way up there and a lot closer to the equator, kind of in the desert. But if you look down where I was uh, putting the blue star, that's where the fossils are that I go get are in Antarctica. And there it's all green. And Antarctica is not by itself. Antarctica is still attached to Australia and India and Africa and South America the bottom of the world like that, which is pretty cool and sort of a crazy thing to think about the world using to be like that. So going to Antarctica, before we talk about any science or any fossils, a lot of people like to know like, well, how do you even get to Antarctica? So before I lived in Pocatello, I lived in Seattle. So that's where my plane trip started, not from here. So I had to fly to Los Angeles, which was my first time going to Los Angeles. That was kind of fun. But then I had to go on a really big, big, big flight all the way across the Pacific to New Zealand went to the North Island, to this, the big city there called Auckland. Then I had to get on another plane and go to the South Island, the city called Christchurch, which was super cool. And that was the first time I'd ever been in like an earthquake, which was kind of scary, but we're not gonna talk about that today. And finally, from New Zealand, you get on a plane and you go down to McMurdo, which is one of the United States' 
three big bases that we have down in Antarctica. It's the biggest one. It's the biggest base on the whole continent. It's one of the American bases and it's the biggest group of people anywhere on Antarctica. So before we fly down there, when we're in New Zealand, we have to get all outfitted. So when you go to Antarctica, you of course can bring your own coat and bring your own gloves and bring your own hat, but they don't know what everybody is gonna have or what everybody owns. So when you go there, you go through New Zealand and the polar program there, the National Science Foundation of our country, the US, suits you up. You get all of this gear and they make sure it fits you just right. Everything from those little bunny boots over on the right, which will keep your feet really warm. I got those blue ones there on the second shelf, all the way to the very famous big red coat, which is over there on the far left. Um, so there's my big red coat. Big red is super cool. This is like the warmest coat I've ever worn by a million years and it has so many pockets. So you, when you're out and you're climbing around and you're looking for fossils and you're finding fossils, you can keep everything in all your pockets. You can keep all your pairs of gloves because you have to layer up the gloves because it gets pretty cold, all in there. And so you can see those orange bags all laid out, two bags per person. Those are all like laid out right for us after we get our sizes done. So then before we head to Antarctica, we step into this hangar, grab our bags after we get all suited up with all of our cool clothes and get on the plane. And the plane was pretty cool. So to fly to uh, Antarctica from New Zealand, we get to get on this, a C-17 Globemaster, which are these big cargo planes the US military has. So the Air Force uh, are the people that fly us down there. And actually the United States Air Force is like the big presence in Antarctica. A lot of other countries contract through us, through the United States military to like fly around. So we like are all over that place helping scientists move around. But Antarctica is pretty cool because nobody owns it. It's all shared under a big international agreement that the only thing that's happening down there is scientific research. So people are looking at outer space, people are looking at weather, people are looking at glaciers, I'm looking at fossils. You know, nobody's digging up anything like for minerals, no one's breaking through the ice to dig up something. It is a place of research and cooperation. And so it's really, really a fantastic thing uh, to be a part of. And so you get on this big old plane and there's no seats, you know, like when maybe you've been on a plane before and there's like a seat you get to sit on and a tray table. No, we're just like kind of in the cargo netting with like a little belt that goes across your waist. And uh, we're flying down with a bunch of cargo that's going to all the people that live down there um, at the big bases. And when you get there, it's awesome. This is the very, very first photo I took when I got off the plane. Well, I didn't take it, photo of me when I got off the plane. That's right after I stepped off. Um, got my big red on, got my big boots. You have, to be, you have to have all your gear on when you get off so they know you have it. And the reason this is such a cool picture is because you can see that where I'm standing is very, very, very flat. And the reason it's so flat is because that is the water. This is frozen ocean. So the airport down at McMurdo isn't on the land. The ice, the frozen ocean is so thick that gigantic planes can land on it and take off. And it's perfectly flat. The islands are all craggly and big rocks there's no place you could put a runway but out on the ocean ice nice and flat and so it's a little freaky to imagine your big old plane that's really heavy landing on the ice but that's what we do and so i'm standing there on the ocean ice and you can see in the background like sort of like a big hill that's mount erebus that's one of the southernmost volcanoes in the world and it's active so you can see there's a little bit of steam and smoke coming out the top and so that was just really awesome and so at the base of the mountain you might be able to see if you look there's like some rock and tucked into that rock is McMurdo, the biggest human presence uh, in Antarctica. So a little bit of a primer for you guys on Antarctica. Antarctica, this is what it looks like if you were like in a spaceship above the South Pole looking down, right? Usually we see it as like all spread out along the bottom of the map, but it's a continent too. And if you go below the earth, Antarctica will look like that. Um, I hope you all recognize what that gray shape is right? That's the U.S. And that'll give you some idea of how big Antarctica is. Antarctica is a whole continent, right? So it's way bigger than our country. And I think it really surprises people because you can see where Idaho would be or where Florida or Texas or New York. They're really, really spread out. And that's almost all just ice and snow. So if you go down to Antarctica, you're probably going to go to one of two places first. Maybe you'll go to a third. And there are these. These are the United States research stations that exist in Antarctica. So we've got one way up there at the top on the left called Palmer Station. That's under South America. Um, and that's a pretty big one. There's a lot of people who study the ocean down at Palmer Station. 
The US has the big old base at South Pole Station, which is of course the ultimate one to get to. I didn't get to go there, but I got to go close. That's like the real like South Pole of the whole planet right there in the middle of Antarctica. And then McMurdo is the one I went to. So McMurdo is on a little island that has the volcano on it um, under New Zealand. So I basically flew in from the bottom of your screen to land at McMurdo. Um, and that's it. Other countries have their own bases. The South Africans, the New Zealanders, the Canadians, the Norwegians, the Russians. Everybody has bases on Antarctica. But those are our three big bases. And this is what McMurdo looks like. It doesn't look uh, too gorgeous, I would say. <laughs> when we're there and the snows are mostly melted on the open rock, um, you can see we've got great big fuel tanks. Um, in the background there are some like long brown buildings all lined up. Those are the dormitories. Um, the big blue building is like the cafeteria and the restaurant. There's a couple bars there, if you can believe it. There's actually three of them. There's a yoga studio, there's a church, um, and then there's lots of research labs and trucks and stuff like that. So everybody lands in planes way out there on the ocean in the distance, and then we get on these big old, I don't think I have a picture of one for you actually, these big old trucks with big inflatable tires that are really bouncy. We drive all the way up, it's like you're on the moon uh, to go to McMurdo. And so McMurdo is a totally uh, outpost of the United States. There's a post office there, they've got a pretty old computer lab, you know, it's cafeteria, there's ATMs, so you can get some money to go to the gift shop or go to the bar or whatever you want to do, which is really funny. So a lot of the scientists, like people like me, I was so young when I first went, um, but other, other people have been going for decades, researchers and, and staff and mechanics, people who work down there, you know, they have to live. So it's really sort of bizarre to be down there. And it's sort of like, it reminds me kind of of ISU. It's like a little college campus um, out in the middle of, you know, freezing snow and ice and not nobody else for a really long time uh and so it's kind of funny and you get kind of cozy and you get used to it so because of some blizzards i was actually at mcmurdo for uh weeks because i couldn't leave the plane nobody could come or go because of all the bad weather so i hung out there for a long time so one of the things that happens when you're in mcmurdo um is some people never leave mcmurdo they they land oh we got a question What type of seats were on my transport to McMurdo? Like nothing. Like I mean, like if you ever see like a cargo net in an airplane, like um, or in like the back of a truck, sometimes there's like a net sort of thing that's made of like canvas. So we had like a little pop down seat, like that was nothing. It was like two little metal bars with some canvas between it. And then we're like leaning back on the cargo nets. And then a seat belt is like woven through the cargo net. And that cargo net's used to like actually do stuff with cargo most of the time. But when they have to fly a bunch of us down, we, we get to be the cargo. That's, that's what my seat was like. That's a good question. Um, so, um, what was I gonna say? Oh, right, so some people, when they go to McMurdo, they don't leave McMurdo. Maybe they're there to study um, some penguins or some seals or some of the really crazy animals that live at the bottom of the ocean right there on Antarctica. So they stay at McMurdo the whole time and they'll do their research there. Some people study the weather. They stay there the whole time. I am, oh, I'm gonna talk about my fossils, don't worry. So I study the fossils, right? And so I need to go to a place where I can find fossils. And if I gotta go find fossils, I have to leave McMurdo. We have to go like out into the wilderness, me and the people I work with. And so when we were at McMurdo, we had to get trained. Oops. We had to get trained. So this is what we had to do once we got there. They, not only do they have to make sure that you have the warm coat and make sure that you have the warm hat, they have to make sure that you're not gonna, you know, freeze to death out there. You gotta make sure you know what you're doing. So we had to learn how to use a radio that's like made out of just wires. We had to learn how to cut the snow with a saw. It's so dry that you can cut the snow with a saw and like build a snow wall. We had to do a simulation of um, what if your plane crashes and then you have to wait for three days? How are you gonna survive out there? We had to do everything and it took days and it was really scary, but like also really fun. Like we all had a great time. Uh, you can see the weather was great during our training. So near the end of the training, one of the things you have to do is spend a night out on the ice. And so what you guys are seeing there in the left-hand side is just like a piece of, of, in the snow, just a place that I picked. There's nothing special about it. And I drew out like a little line that's about my size and I use the saw and I just cut into the snow. And then I cut down more and keep pulling out blocks. And so I made myself this like little place to sleep in the snow and there's nothing else. I don't have any like insulation except for my coats and stuff like that. 
and it looks a lot like a grave and it kind of felt like a grave to dig it and then get in it. But you can see I put the snow blocks um, up on top of me and uh, spent the night like that. And that was part of the training. And then you get to graduate and then they let you go do whatever you're there to do. And so for me, that question from before, I was there to look for fossils. So after I passed my training, they said, okay, you can go with the rest of your team. I was with a whole team of paleontologists. You know, we can go dig up our fossils. One other thing I think you guys should know is I took that picture right before I went to bed. Can you see that there's all that light coming out of the snow above me? I took that picture at almost 11 o'clock at night, 11 p.m., and the snow was well lit. The sun never sets when we are down there. So for like half the year almost, Antarctica is very dark and it almost sees no sun. And then the other half of the year, it's super bright. And that's because the earth is tilted, right? So when we have our winter, Antarctica is all sunshine, all the time, for weeks and weeks and weeks straight. And that was one thing about being there that was kind of fun to get used to, was the fact that when I was there, and I was there for about six weeks, it never, ever, ever got dark for six weeks. So think about that. All right, so you guys asked about fossils. Now let's actually talk about what I really was doing. So the, one of the first questions I usually get asked when I talk to people about digging up fossils and looking for fossils in Antarctica is, isn't it difficult digging through all that ice? All of that ice and snow is all over the rocks. You guys might know that, you know, to get a fossil out of the ground, you have to find it and it's gonna be sticking out of the ground somewhere. It's gonna be in the rocks. And so <laughs> if the rocks are totally covered in ice, sometimes miles of ice, how are we gonna find them? And that's a funny question because we don't, look under the ice that would take so long it would be so hard and so not fun so we go to places like this places where the rock is exposed so you can see there's a lot of white down on the ground down there like on the horizon that's a big glacier uh, and there's some snow you know like snow from the sky like normal snow sometimes on the rocks but usually that blows away pretty quick antarctica is pretty dry and pretty windy so we go to places like this where there's sedimentary rocks so that's like a sandy rock or a mud rock from a river or a lake. And that's where we find fossils if we're digging around in Montana or in Wyoming or in Idaho. And it's the same kind of thing in Antarctica. If you find the right kind of rocks um, that can preserve fossils from a certain time period and you know how old the rocks are, you can go check them out. So that's what we were doing. And we knew from people who had gone before us, scientists who had gone before us, that some of the rocks in Antarctica had the things we were interested in. And I'll tell you about what those are in a second. So we go to where the rocks are. So where are the rocks um, in Antarctica? This is a composite image here of a bunch of satellite photos of Antarctica. So, you know, the snow is a little bit, it's not all pure white all the time. So this is what Antarctica looks like from above. And there is a lot of snow and ice. But if you kind of look really carefully, you might see starting down at the bottom of the screen, part of Antarctica is kind of dark colored. And then there's like a, it kind of curves up like this. And then it goes towards the peninsula, which goes up towards South America, and that's very dark too. And all the black you're seeing there, that's called, those are called the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. That's a mountain range that goes across Antarctica. Everything that's dark gray in that picture is the ice, the ice cap, solid, solid ice. Sometimes it's miles thick. The lighter color gray is the sea ice, so parts of the ocean that are always frozen. But the black, is the mountaintops, the mountaintops that are sticking just above the ice. So like the picture I put behind me here today, those are the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, just a little bit of a mountain top, only the top, poking out of this huge amount of ice. And that's the only place on the whole continent that there's rocks. So if you're a paleontologist like me, you have to go to those mountains. So we're gonna zoom in. So you can see that little blue box shut up. That's where I was going. And then that little red cross right there on that one little glacier, is the place where we actually went to go build our camp. So we're leaving McMurdo. McMurdo, which was really fun and really like a luxury place, you, you know, you could hang out and go to the cafeteria. Now we're going way up into the mountains, kind of all by ourselves with another couple of research teams, people that study glaciers, people that study weather, people that study meteorites, and us. So at McMurdo, there were a couple thousand people. Where we're gonna go, there's like 80 people. And so we're way off by ourselves up there in the mountains. And this is how we get there. We go back to that airport at McMurdo out on the sea ice. And we get on another plane flown by the US Air Force. This one's called a C-130 Hercules or a Herc. 
And I hope you're looking at that plane carefully and maybe noticing that we don't really have wheels. The wheels are there, but we strapped skis to it instead because this plane is always taking off and landing on snow. And so the propellers are what gives it all of its force and all of its ability to stop. You know, the wheels are just there to touch the ground. And so in Antarctica, the planes are on skis, even the really big ones, which is really fun. Now, this didn't happen for me, and I'm sorry, and I'm very disappointed. But when these planes take off, sometimes they're stuck. The ski is so big that the snow is wet. There's a little bit of a time when it sticks to the snow. And so it's hard to take off. Or like when we load up all of our fossils, the plane is really, really, really heavy. And so to get over that, the planes have this special ability. It's called JATO, which is Jet Assisted Takeoff, J-A-T-O. And I hope you can see there on the side, that's where they kind of fire these rockets off the back of the plane, even while all the propellers are going as fast as they can to take off. And so the JATO, I was never on a plane that had to do that, which I was bummed about. But uh, some of my fossils that we dug up were on a plane that had to do that. And so you can see this plane came all the way from New York, which is really cool. So people from all over the world fly their planes down and help or get contracted to help in Antarctica, um, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, so there we go. We're leaving McMurdo, leaving the coast. We're all trained. We have our coats. And now we're going up into the mountains in the very middle, the deep wilderness of Antarctica. And this is what the camp looked like when I flew into land. This is the whole thing. So those yellow buildings are, you know, a couple of them are scientific labs. The really big long one is our cafeteria. Across from them, you can see those little black boxes. Those are just porta potties with big holes that go down really far into the ice. So don't fall into that porta potty. And that's all we have. That's where we lived. I was there for six weeks, living there, all time sunny, sunny all the time. And I remember when I first went, people were like, oh my gosh, is that gonna be so cold? You're just living on a glacier. And this is what we're living in. We just have a normal tent. The tent's got the normal, uh, it's a four season tent, but it's got the normal uh, cover, like any tent you could buy at a store would have. You can see the tents are all North Face, you know, they're nothing too crazy. But remember that it's always sunny. It's always, always sunny. So sometimes it's hard to sleep, but also that means your tent is always getting hit by the sun. So it's always staying pretty warm. So actually some people had to move their tents because after a few days, their body heat melts into the ice because we're just on a glacier and then they'd have to sleep in like a bowl. They didn't like that. So then they had to move their tent. And so we're just on the middle of, on the middle of this glacier. That picture I put up there of the doorway, I think is pretty fun. So instead of spending a bunch of money on refrigerators. You don't need refrigerators for the food for weeks for 80 people. They just dig a big hole in the glacier. And then if you go down that, open that door, there's a staircase and you go down inside the glacier and then there's just shelves they've put in. And that's where we kept all of our food and it stayed very, very frozen, which is pretty cool. So, okay, you guys wanna know about fossils. So we're finally here, finally living in Antarctica, right where the fossils are. The fossils are up in the hills. They're in those mountains that are behind the camp. So those mountains are made of rocks, sandstones and mudstones that have the fossils we were interested in finding. But you can't walk there. They're all miles and miles and miles away. And it's a glacier you're sitting on. So there's crevasses, you know, cracks and big scary holes that you might not see. You do not want to walk around and accidentally fall into a crevasse. So to get from our camp all the way up to the different places where we want to go look for fossils, we got to take some pretty sweet uh, helicopters. So these are National Science Foundation helicopters. They're Hueys. Um, I had never been in a helicopter before, before I went to Antarctica. And so you get to get in every single morning and go and go to this mountain and spend the whole day, you know, you bring your sandwich and you bring your Capri Sun or whatever, and you look for fossils all day. And then at four o'clock or five o'clock, the helicopter comes and picks you up and takes you back to that camp. And then the next day, maybe you go back because it was really good, or maybe you didn't find anything. So then you have to go somewhere else. So these helicopters were so much fun and we all loved them. The thing I wanna point out to you, if you can see the screen right now, is you can see there's one picture where the helicopter has a big rock hanging underneath it in one of its cargo nets. So it picked up a big rock off the mountain and was bringing it back to camp. That's a rock from one of the sites that we went to that's Jurassic. So it's a Jurassic in age, it's about almost 200 million years old. And that block is full of a dinosaur. The dinosaur is Cryolophosaurus. Some of you maybe have heard of Cryolophosaurus. It's got a big crest on its head that faces forward like this. There's only ever been two Cryolophosaurus fossil, fossils ever, ever, ever found 
And that's one of them. And they're both from the exact same place. They were found right next to each other on one mountain in the middle of this in Antarctica. So a really big meat-eating dinosaur from that habitat. So when Antarctica, uh, when sorry, when Crylophosaurus was alive, Antarctica did not look like this. So why did I go? Well, I'm a paleontologist. I study fossils. That's what I'm doing here in Idaho. That's why I'm the new curator. I study a period, two periods of time that are pretty old, way older than mammoths and saber-toothed cats and way older than T-Rex. So I study the Permian period and the Triassic period. And so what you're seeing on your screen right now is what we call the geological time scale. So how geologists map out all the history of the past. And so if you look on the side of your screen where it says zero and 50 and 100, those are all millions and millions of years ago. So 50 million years ago, 100 million years ago, 400 million years ago. And so you and I are living right at the very top. We're standing like the top of the purple, the top of the pink, that's all the same. We are right there, that's the present. And if you go deeper and deeper into the rock record back in time, you can go back. So you guys might see words you recognize. You might see Cretaceous or Jurassic. Maybe you know Cambrian from the Cambrian explosion, which is when we first start finding fossils, some of the oldest fossils of animals that you can see with your naked eye. Those are Cambrian. So the periods I study are the Permian, and the Triassic. So the Permian comes first and the Triassic comes second. I hope you can see them, they're on your screen. There's a big red line that I've put between them. And I put that big red line there because the worst mass extinction ever, that ever happened in the whole history of the world happens between the Permian and the Triassic periods. That's how we tell them apart. There's a line where it's very awful and lots and lots and lots of things go extinct. They die forever. So you guys maybe heard of the asteroid impact that you know hits in Mexico, and that's what makes T-Rex and Triceratops go extinct. That's also a mass extinction. But that one wasn't as bad as this one. This one took out a lot more stuff. So the time periods I study are about, like I said, about 250 million years old. You can see on the time scale there, you can trace it out um, where the red line is. Um, that's the largest mass extinction of all time. And uh, in Antarctica, where I put that black box just there. In Antarctica, there's rocks that show us a little bit of the end of the Permian, and then a pretty good amount of the beginning of the Triassic with the extinction happening in the middle. And so Antarctica is one of the only places in the world where there's rocks that were deposited on land, so by like lakes and rivers, not the ocean, that preserves that transition. So that's why we spend all this time and all this money to go to Antarctica instead of going to like, you know, Arizona or Canada because Arizona and Canada don't have rocks that are the right age to tell us about what really happened then. Antarctica is one of the places on the world that does. And so that's why we went there to study this time period in particular. Uh, and then there's similarities between what we find in Antarctica, between what other people have found in places like South Africa. So South Africa has a really good fossil record. Uh, the last thing I'll say here is that pink period of time, it's called the Mesozoic era. That's the age of dinosaurs. So the Triassic, which is the younger rocks that I was looking at, the Triassic period um, is when dinosaurs first evolve. It's when they first show up. It's when mammals first show up. It's when turtles first evolve. It's when crocodiles first evolve. So a bunch of really cool things happen in the Triassic. And so we were there to look for some of the earliest um, mammal and dinosaur relatives we could find um, in Antarctica. Um, oh, hey, Hope. Hope asks, what caused the mass extinction? Ooh, Hope, good question. Um, I don't have slides for that in this, but I can tell you. So really, really, really crazy amounts of volcanic activity that were happening in what is now Russia, sort of in the Siberian part of Russia. Back then, so I could go back to the Pangea map and show you if you guys wanted to, maybe after I finish it, we can do more questions. Um, there's huge amounts of volcanic eruptions, so much, huge amounts that are piling up lava miles thick. And that's not really so much the problem. The problem is that when volcanoes erupt, they emit all kinds of things like um, methanes and sulfur compounds. I know I'm getting into chemistry here and things like just simple stuff like carbon dioxide. And that changes the atmosphere. And so we have in the Permian Triassic an example of basically a global warming situation that got out of control. And so you have things like the die off of lots of plants and then the collapse of all the plant eaters and meat eaters kind of in order. The whole event is so gargantuan and it actually takes 60,000 years to fully happen. 
So if you were alive during the extinction event, you wouldn't really notice anything was wrong. Like the time that when T-Rex gets hit with the asteroid, that's like, obviously everything's fine. And then you get hit with an asteroid. So it's like, it's over. It's a really incredibly bad extinction, but it happens like that. The volcanoes in Russia that were causing this, they took a long time to do it. And we really only see how awful it was by like looking backwards in time and seeing all the things that went away. Uh, do the volcanoes have names? They do. They're called the Siberian traps. Traps like in your, you know, catching a mouse or something. T-R-A-P-S. Siberian traps. Yeah. Um, so I, we could definitely talk about that. I wish I had slides for it. So in Darkscale, we don't have like a very, I didn't really focus on like the boundary itself. Wish I could show you guys some cool pictures of, of what that looks like. Uh, Antarctica does have fossils though, of plants and animals that lived before and then some of them died out and then there's things that happened afterwards and that's what we were there to look at. Um, this is what, you know, here's the continents that you guys might recognize today. So Africa and South America is turned sideways and Antarctica is the one that says beacon on it. And then Australia is also sideways. So that's what they looked like when they were all together, when they were all part of Pangaea. And so what's cool is, where those arrows are all pointing was the edge of the big continent of Pangaea and some oceanic crusts, the crust of the earth that's under the ocean was going under there and causing mountains and volcanoes to pop up where there's those orange, uh, orange diagonal lines. And then like anytime you make a mountain, when it rains and snows and the things erode down, you can erode the mountains and that's how you build sediment. And that's what fills up lakes and rivers with sand and mud. And so in South America, there's the Parana, and in Africa, there's the Karoo, in Antarctica, there's the Beacon. And so all four of these continents have areas where rocks are deposited in the same ways from the same totally gone now mountain range. And that's why we can look in Antarctica to find fossils and then compare them to other parts of the world, which is a pretty cool thing. So here's your reminder of what Antarctica looked like. I showed this to you really early, just to sort of make you go like, oh, right, wow. Um, but so as to refresh you, we're way down there now, right? We are way down in Antarctica. There's mountains along the bottom and there's this really nice place to go look. And it's green. It's green in this picture. Why would we know it's green? Why would we think it's green? Well, we have a bunch of reasons to suspect why it was warmer, but there's also some pretty good evidence. Oh, there's Pocatello again. There's also some pretty great stuff that I think are some of the coolest fossils I've ever seen in my life. There's places you can go on these mountains where if you walk around, you can walk around the forest that really used to be there. So this is just pictures I took walking around on one of these mountains. And so the picture in the top left is just some wood, fossilized wood, uh, permineralized wood coming up out of the ground like a petrified forest. Um, if you look at the picture on the bottom, on the right, I hope you, hope you can see the rings of the tree, the stump that's just sticking right up out of the ground. And what's really cool is some parts of the area down there in, in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains are so full of um, these trees and their roots that you can actually feel what the forest would have really felt like. And then in the little bit of mud between all these tree stumps, sometimes there's fossils of all the leaves they would drop. So these things over there on the bottom left, those are fossils of leaves. So you're standing there, you're surrounded, it's freezing cold, you're surrounded by ice, and you can tell, here's where this forest used to be, here's the trees, here's their roots, here's their leaves. It's super cool. And so most of those trees are uh, from the Permian part of the period, but there's also some Triassic age trees we went to look at too. And we know a lot about their anatomy, that's what that scientific diagram is. And they're, they're not really closely related to any trees that are alive anymore. I think this is always a fun thing to show people. Anybody recognize what that is? That's my boot there in the corner, the little orange thing. Those are ripples from the side of a little lake, just like calm little ripples. And that's, you know, obviously there's nice and uh, free flowing water down there. And that's really poetic and really nice to think about. Um, were there Indian ruins, asked Axel. Uh, no, nope. That's one thing actually people ask all the time when I talk about Antarctica, but it's really hard to imagine. Nobody has ever, ever that anybody knows about lived in Antarctica, except for in the last 100 or maybe 200 years that people have even gone there in boats, like big ships. Russians have gone there and we've gone there and 
British explorers have gone there, but there's never any like indigenous people in Antarctica. Since humans have evolved, Antarctica has always been totally frozen and icy. We're really new. We didn't get to see it when it was all pretty and nice. Okay, now I wanna show you guys some actual cool vertebrate animals, because I'm the paleontology guy who's digging up, you know, dinosaurs and stuff. So let's talk about that. Hey, Brandon. Yeah. Before you go on, we have a question, another question from Aiden about oh, okay. trees. Yes, yeah. that's right, Aiden. Um, question. Oh. Yeah. Uh, have you found a tree that leaves half a tree? Oh yeah, there's whole fossil logs down there. And people have actually done things that they can do with trees that are alive today, where they can like core into a tree and like look at the rings. And there's actually a really cool thing about the fossil trees, which is that um, today when a tree freezes or in the winter time, you guys know tree rings are like light and dark and light and dark and light and dark. That's every year when they grow. And when it's the little dark band, they start to slow down their growth because it's cold. And sometimes on, if you look under a microscope, the cells inside the tree's wood have popped from when they froze. Some of the trees in Antarctica have been looked at like that with a microscope and almost none of them, even if they live to be 200 years old, have any ring that ever popped because it was frozen. So that whole 200 years of that tree's life, it never froze once, which is really amazing to think about because it still gets pretty dark down there, but it, the whole world is so warm that the tree never freezes. So yeah, we find the logs. Did I bring someone with me? I did. What type of food did we eat? Oh, pretty great food, actually. We ate everything. Uh, we can talk about that later. <laughs> uh, there were no diet limitations. We ate everything. Uh, I did bring somebody with me. Um, this is one of my best friends. He's, he's helped me dig. So if you guys look next to that brush, I hope you can see the white. And so that is some bone that was sticking out of the ground. That's what bone looks like in Antarctica when you find it. So it's not the same color as the rock, which is really good. And so we knew we had something pretty cool in there. And so we started digging and you can see that's me with the blue boots and the hammer going like this. It's really hard to dig in Antarctica because um, you, uh, the rock is just like totally, totally like concrete. And so we have to use uh, rock saws, which are like a big circular saw that has a diamond tip on the blade. You have to cut into the mountain and cut into the mountain and then chisel it away. And so me and my friend Adam there, we had been doing that for like two or three days when this photo was taken, because we think somewhere in the middle there is the rest of this bone. We don't want to expose it when we're there, because if it breaks, we're not gonna be able to fix it. We want to get it back to the museum to actually show it. Uh, what tools did you use? Found? It looks like we lost Brandon. I'll see if I can get him back. Oh, my internet dropped out, you guys. <laughs> Isn't that awful? <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Am I back? Are we good? Well, I see you. So okay. let's get back in there. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have finished it for you, Brandon. <laughs> that was so scary, you guys. That was my internet. <laughs> 
So thanks a lot. Um, I guess we're doing a lot of things on here. Okay, so so we found this animal. I think this is what I was saying when I left you guys. It was this big amphibian. And so kind of like a frog or a salamander. But I don't think you guys understand how really big it was. This is how big it is. There's a person swimming next to how big this amphibian was. So one of the animals we find down there, there's actually four different kinds, are these big kind of like salamander things that are like 12 to 15 feet long. And so they live in the rivers, they hunt along the shore. We think they wait kind of like crocodiles and alligators do today and then grab their prey and bring them down into the water, which is pretty crazy to think about an amphibian doing that. But this is from this part of the Triassic period that actually is before crocodiles even existed. Crocodiles hadn't evolved yet. So the animals in the water doing kind of a crocodile thing were these big amphibians. And then here's, this is one more picture of it from when we were digging it up. So I put a blue triangle on there. That blue triangle is the rock that we had been chiseling away to expose. And the head is inside that triangle. And then that's me and my friend, and we're pretending to be its body and its arms and its legs. So we can show you guys how big it is. So it would have been a pretty big and scary animal. And it was really heavy and we had to carry it all the way back to the helicopter and then convince the helicopter guy to fly it back. And now it's awesome. It's in the museum in Seattle. If you ever find yourself in Seattle, go check it out. It's a really cool fossil. Uh, but not every animal we find there is big. Some of them, especially the earliest relatives of crocodiles and dinosaurs that lived back then are actually really small, which is super cute. Um, so there's me. Um, you can see I have a gross little mustache because I'm not allowed to shave or I wasn't shaved when I was down there. And so there's in the snow. And if you look right down below me, there's some white in the uh, crack of the rock that's dark. And those are all bones. And we dug it around. We got this whole thing out. And we found this beautiful little skeleton of this animal that looks kind of like a lizard, um, but it's not a lizard. It's existing in the beginning of the Triassic period, right when reptiles are first diversifying and evolving to all kinds of different stuff. And this animal is a really close relative of what will become crocodiles and dinosaurs, which is super cool and was really exciting to find. This animal is also found in South Africa, so it was like a cool connection. Uh, another one we found, this is a picture of me with like our big hall. So those boxes you're seeing behind me are all full of all the fossils we dug up. It was like so much weight. We had like a bobcat try to pick it up, you know, and the bobcat like tilts forward because like we got a lot of really good fossils. But one of the ones we found actually turned out to be a new species and I got to name it and that's what I named it. I named it Antarctinax shackletoni. And so this is what the rocks look like when we bring them back to the lab and then we prepare them. We very carefully in the lab take the rock away so we can see all the bones that are in there. And so I don't know if you guys will see this, but I colored it for you. So the blue things are all the vertebrae, the backbones of the animal that we found in there. The yellow bone is its humerus, so the barn and bone in the upper arm. And then the red ones you're seeing, that's one of his feet. So can you see the toes and the claws that are in there? which is super cool. And so once we got all the fossil prepared and removed the rock from around it, we got to see that, oh, this isn't that other one that I already showed you, Prolocerta. This is a little reptile, but it's a different kind. So we had to give it a cool name and you know describe it. So I had a paper come out last year describing that fossil finally. So that's like a little artistic drawing of what Antarctica would have been like back then. And the new one we, we named, Antarctinax, that's him in the blue. And then that one I already showed you, Prolocerta, is the one that's sleeping on a log, the little one. And then some of the other things in there are other animals we found um, from the Triassic period down there in Antarctica. And it shows you what Antarctica looks like with those big trees and flowing water. It doesn't look anything like it looks today. It's like a green, cool place to go. I would love to get in a time machine and go back there. So those were the Triassic rocks. So the ones just after that big mass extinction. And those are the ones I was personally the most interested in studying. But we also went to some Jurassic rocks, so another 50 million years younger, and that's where the big dinosaurs come from. So if you know Cryolophosaurus, I got to go up to the Cryolophosaurus quarry and help out all these people dig up these big dinosaurs, and that was pretty sweet. So Antarctica is still where Antarctica is, and Pocatello is still where Pocatello is, but this map is the Jurassic. So you can see that the continents are a little different, Pangaea is starting to break up a little bit. That little thin ocean that's cutting through the middle is cutting between North Carolina and Africa kind of weird to think about. Okay, so here's the skull of Cryolophosaurus, the first one they found. I bet you don't think that looks like very much because it's only the back of a skull and it's kind of broken. But if you don't know, this is what Cryolophosaurus looked like 
So that thing sticking off the top, you're seeing it as a sideways thing. The first specimen they found had the nose broken off. So it's only the eyeballs and the brain and the back of the head. But this is this really early, big, meat-eating dinosaur. And so cryolophosaurus means frozen crested lizard. And so I hope you can figure out why it's called a frozen crested lizard, because it's from Antarctica, and it looks like that. So it's a pretty cool dinosaur. And so this was me um, helping out at that Crylophosaurus quarry. So that bottom picture on the left, you can maybe see on the, on the rock, there's like a Sharpie and somebody outlined one, of the outlined one of the bones from the back, one of the spinal bones, a vertebra. Um, and then that's me using the jackhammer. And this was like one of the coolest days probably of my whole life because we had to go from where we were on the glacier to the top of this mountain. So we're at 12,500 feet in elevation, way, way up really high and so this bad weather came in and you can see the helicopter behind me in the photo and so we are above the storm we're above the clouds in antarctica digging up this really awesome dinosaur with jackhammers so i only got to go up there a couple times um, when we weren't doing triassic stuff um, but it was like the coolest thing possible it was the best um, not a lot of people take helicopters above the clouds in antarctica to dig up dinosaurs it's pretty legit um, but it's not just Crylophosaurus that's known from there. So that same place where they're digging up those big Crylophosaurus bones, there's other fossils around. And so whenever we like have a lunch break or something, we go poke and see what we could find. And actually there's lots of other dinosaurs they have from there now too. So the picture you're seeing is the part of a foot of a really early long-necked dinosaur. So one of the early sauropod dinosaurs. And so that's why I put a little purple square there on the ankle. So they found the ankle. And then I put a little blue square on the other one because they found a different species. And they found like the big thigh bone and some of the hips of the bigger species. Uh, we also found bones of like a little plant eating dinosaur. And it's really frustrating because it's really hard to know what kind of little plant eater it was. So we're not quite sure. But at the beginning of the Jurassic period, when Crylophosaurus is alive, like that's one of the biggest predators around. And it's, it's pretty big. And uh, the long neck dinosaurs are starting to get really big. You know, they're getting to be almost elephant size. But, you know, in the future, they're going to be like 10 elephants. So <laughs> this is early for them, too. We don't just find dinosaurs there, though, which is really cool. We, they also found, not me, people who've been there before, have found bones that belong to some of the first pterodactyls. And they found teeth of mammals, really close relatives of ours, cynodont mammals, or cynodonts uh, that are related to us mammals, like not too far off at all. And so it's really cool to see this like different window in time into um, the Jurassic period in Antarctica, when it's still green and there's still lots of cool animals running around in a forest. Um, down at the bottom of the world. Um, after we left camp and we had all of our hall of fossils, we went back to the coast and we had to wait again for a plane to fly us back to New Zealand. And I really like this time because I like going outside. I really like nature. And so we got to walk around and check out whatever we could find. And so this is when I saw some penguins. So I saw some emperor penguins and Adelie penguins. And you can see a Weddell seal popping up there in the ice. That's one of the coolest seals ever. It like lives the warm-blooded animal that lives the farthest south of anything. Uh, there's a skua, if you guys know your, uh, I don't know, happy feet kind of stuff. Um, and so it was really fun to sort of like wrap up spending so much time all alone in the middle of the ice with no animals and no plants, only people and bones, to then go to the coast and see some of the animals uh, that actually do live in Antarctica today, mostly in the ocean. Um, anyway, here's all the people I went with. I know somebody asked, did you have anybody with you? Yeah, I had a lot of people with me. I was just a student. I wasn't doing anything special. These are the people that are actually in charge. Um, and the National Science Foundation here in the United States, they're the ones that funded it. And um, it was a really great trip. And we've, we've done a lot of work since and made a lot of new discoveries. So it was really, really, really successful. And a lot of those discoveries happen back in the lab once the fossils are safe in the museum. So it's still ongoing, right? And they're trying to go back. <laughs> Anyway, that's all I had for presentation-wise for you guys. Um, I don't know if you want to do a uh, question anything. I don't know. You, you have two questions waiting oh, for you. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. three. There you go. Uh, thank you from Aiden. Aiden, you're welcome. Um, how did you know it was a bone? Oh, that's a tough one, right? Um, well, these, uh, these are all... Uh, Anytime you go look for fossils, if you ever come with the Idaho Museum and we go and we look for fossils at the American Falls Reservoir or somewhere else, sometimes in some places, bone looks like it's white and the rock around it looks like it's brown or black and it's really easy. Other places, it's not so easy. 
So that Crylophosaurus picture you saw where somebody had outlined the bone with a Sharpie, oh boy, I thought that was really hard. But the people that had been working there for years, they, they could see it right away. The bone I showed you of the giant amphibian that was like a white bone and like an orangey brown rock, oh, pff, that's easy. And so it's all about spending time and getting used to the rocks so that you can, you can get your own eye in. But anybody can find puzzles. It's not something you have to like really train for or you know, practice. You just gotta go out and look. Um, you'll find them. Um, is my new species in a museum? Yes, it is, Gabe. It is at, also in Seattle, at the Burke Museum in Seattle, Washington. So if you ever go to Seattle and you wanna go to a cool museum, go to the Burke. Uh, we did collect a lot of plant fossils. And actually the team that was collecting plant fossils they were in, uh, from Kansas. So all those fossils are now at KU. <laughs> if you want to see a bunch of Antarctic trees, you can go to Ohio State or Kansas. That's where a lot of them are now, which is kind of a funny thing, right? Um, the biggest fossil we found, oh, has to be the head of the really big amphibian. I kind of helped with the big dinosaurs, but I didn't find those, so I'm not going to count that. <laughs> I'm going to say the really big amphibian, which is cool. You can look it up. <laughs> How long did it take to dig up Crylophosaurus? Oh boy, Xavier, let me tell you something. They found Crylophosaurus in 1990, so 30 years ago. And then they didn't get to go back to Antarctica until 1994, and they brought back the head and a couple other pieces. And then they didn't go back until 2002, I think, and they brought back some more. And then they went when I went in 2011, and they brought back most of it. So it's taken them almost, and they're still preparing those bones in Chicago. Those bones are at the Field Museum for Crylophosaurus in Chicago and Illinois. And that's taken them 30 years to go back and forth. And when they're actually there, it doesn't take very long to dig it out. What takes so long is getting grants and organizing all these trips to go to Antarctica and then getting them all the way back to America. Once you're digging them up, you know, probably takes like a month or two but that's not how the world works. <laughs> so it's been a long time. Uh, how many fossils did you find exactly? Ooh, um, I remember how much it weighed, but I don't remember how many there are. There's probably like mm, 50 or 60 fossils in the Burke Museum in Seattle of little mammal relatives and little reptiles and, and, and that big amphibian um, that we took back to Seattle with the group I was with. Um, yeah, probably like 50 or 60 animals, which was pretty cool. Uh, how much did it cost? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, it depends what you mean, though, right? Because it's like um, uh, the government, you know, U.S. government is the ones, um, the National Science Foundation, that's like funding all this research. And so it's hard to say how much it costs because you have to think about all the investment of like all the mechanics and the food and all that. But it's like it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to go down there at the end of the day. Um, and do this kind of work. The work itself doesn't cost anything, but getting us all down there is like crazy. Uh, how long did it take you to name your fossil? Oh, how long ago to name your fossil? Well, here's, a, here's an admission for me. When, you have to, when you're a scientist and you have to write a paper, sometimes you come up with the idea for the paper and you figure it out and you know what you're gonna write, but then it takes you a really long time to write it and then it takes even longer for other people to like, other scientists to tell, tell you what they think of it and publish it and then other scientists get to read it. So to answer your question, really, I named it Antarctinax probably six or seven years ago, but the paper came out in 2019. So I don't know if the answer is one year or six years, but a while ago. <laughs> it didn't take me long to name it once I figured out it was new. How big is Antarctica? I don't remember like the actual number of how big Antarctica is, but like I think you saw, if we go back to our slides here. How big is America? Why don't I ask you that? That's how big Antarctica is. So here's Idaho, pretty much like this. <laughs> all of Idaho is basically right here. And here's all of Texas. And here's all of Florida. So Antarctica is really big. It's bigger than the US for sure. It's a big place. Just at the bottom of your map. You should think about it more. <laughs> Well, cool, guys. Thanks for coming. I hope it was fun. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. That was fun. You had um, no questions from Facebook, but a lot of comments of um, they could see how passionate you are about your work and oh, yeah. that um, in, order, in order to go down there and do it, it definitely takes a certain kind of person.
Yeah, <laughs> that's probably true. And congratulations <laughs> to Carrie Fitzharris, who was, I'm assuming, working in Antarctica uh, if they lived there for four years. People down there, like the, there's um, mechanics and janitors and like staff scientists and like cooks and everybody, all kinds of people go down to Antarctica. You know, it's not just scientists and military people. And so people live there sometimes. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So I hope everyone um, will join us next oh, week. Okay for um, Jesse Pruitt talking about what he does at the Idaho Virtualization Lab with 3D printing and, and all that work that he's been doing for the last several years. So we look forward to seeing everyone again, or them seeing us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Bye.